Hello everybody, this is Big Data Applications and Analytics. And this is Jeffrey Fox, your instructor, or at least video recorder, and writer of uh, these particular slides. And now we've got up to lesson five of the motivation. And this is on digital disruption and transformation. We'll start off with the past, the things that have been displaced by the digital revolution that we're now seeing. Towards the end of this particular lesson, we'll come to the future, which is digital transformations, which are enabled by the technologies, clouds and big data and artificial intelligence that underlie everything we do. Thank you. Let's get started. Okay, here is an interesting discussion of again the, the impact of digitization or whatever you want to call it, and the and uh, so these modern developments on traditional services here, the U.S. Postal Service, um, which is famous for losing money. It sort of it has it's, it's mandated to not lose money and mandated to make do things which are clearly very difficult not to lose money on. And um, here we have a plot as a function of time of the, um, if we look at the right, we have an older older piece of data. The plot uh, in this blue thing is the um, number of passive, amount of mail delivery. And the red is the profit and loss. It ran, more or less ran um, flat, I mean, you know, profit equals loss until around uh, at this time here, it dipped down and then it dramatically dipped down here. Um, so that's uh, 2012 and so on. And th this is partly due to something outside the digitization issue that's um, funding health insurance. And uh, But actually, if you notice, today Amazon often uses the US Postal Service. And uh, some of their one day services actually come by US Postal Service. So US Postal Service has um, adapted somewhat. Um, in uh, 2017, when the parcel brought in 19.5 billion, 7 billion of them came from shippers like Amazon. And we do not know how many are Amazon of that. We also know that Amazon is actually uh, trying to actually compete with FedEx, UPS, and USPS, and, deliver, uh, and uh, have its own delivery service, whether it be uh, using traditional methods or drones. And there was a famous statement by Trump complaining that, the, that Amazon's exploiting the US Postal Service. If you explore that uh, post, you will find another article saying, recommending that Amazon run the US Postal Service. Uh, so anyway, this is certainly, things are changing. But in this uh, online shopping world, you definitely need a delivery service. Drones, motorcycles. Trucks, little little nice uh, U.S. Postal Service vehicles. Something has to deliver it. So deliveries are very important, and it's perceived as Amazon has shown the quick delivery is incredibly um, popular with customers. So anyway, notice email is blamed for a lot of the, which is true. I no longer write letters. I didn't write so many actually 30 years ago, but I no longer write any. I always send things electronically. All right, thank you. All right, here's a, this is a pretty sad.
This is a slightly uh, more, in possibly sadder or more interesting. It comes from a book here called um, um, The Collapse of the American Shopping Mall, Black Friday, 2014. And it's by uh, this website here, Seth Lawless, and this is some um, closed mall, which is discussed in this. Uh, this fellow's a photographer and has got lots of nice pictures. And we have, as part of the uh, course, a discussion point called No More Malls, uh, which is discussing the future trends of malls. And actually, we've had that in several previous editions of this course. And there's not agreement here. I think everybody agrees uh, shopping malls will change. Uh, but they, and even if you buy things typically online, shopping malls also have an interesting social um, impact. And also, of course, one area which, so that's certainly uh, can put, says that you, shopping malls need to so focus on uh, maybe the things that people go out to do, eat, and uh, talk and have coffee shops and things, and not so much on shopping. Now, there is this, of course, trend uh, that's two important aspects. One is that groceries are still dominantly uh, bought in brick and mortar stores. And also, you could argue that um, you can't try things on as well on the internet. However, the internet companies are willing to let you buy things, try them on, and send them back. And that is actually possibly. More attractive than going to the mall, when you can only try on the things they have in the mall, whereas you can try on anything. This is the long tail effect. Internet shopping gives you access to much more than than uh, physical shops. Okay, here are some mathematical data and statistics about closings. On the right, a somewhat older chart from around 2014. Uh, detailing various major vendors such as Barnes & Noble. Uh, with their retail scope, announced retail store closings. Um, I remember when Barnes & Noble was such a magnificently thriving store. The one in Bloomington is closed. Uh, Staples, that's still open locally. Um, GameStop, Gap, Abercrombie & Fitch, Aeropostal, JCPenney. And of course, Sears is struggling continuously. So these are announcements as a over a big time period, here's a 10 year time period, five year time period. This is uh, over a certain final date. And here's an actual data from 2017 and 2018. The black are the positive numbers, they're the openings, and the red are the closings. So 2017 had 4,000 closings, uh, 2018 had 2,500. If you look in um, 2019, it's um, running at 700 closings by early February, which is quite high compared to um, 200 closing in the same time period in 2018. So it's possible 2019 um, will not be so good. We, I don't think anybody knows. Of course, if there's a recession, which is now being predicted by some, then that will certainly encourage a shift from the old to the new. Um, so. If you use fulfillment by Amazon, it's actually much easier to run a store than if you actually have to uh, electronically, than if you have to run it for real um, in a brick and mortar uh, place. This interested me from business intelligence. It's a plot of, as of until around 2020, in the future from 2001, of the fraction of retail sales in various categories. Just sold online, and you can see in media, sporting, and hobby ho hobby goods is dominantly online. Here we are at 65% in 2020. Electronics, 50%. Pretty very high. What struck me as interesting was furniture. Furniture is and home furnishings is 30%. That's big. Clothing is high. I would expect that because it's so easy and to buy things online. I buy my clothes online. And of course, here we have the small one, food and beverage. I don't quite know why health and personal care, maybe you really need to, to look at the real thing to, to make those decisions. But anyway, this is striking how the, and 
and uh, how it, there are some very important differences in categories between the fractions purchased online. All right, so here is a graph we've seen various versions of. Even in the 2019, it wasn't upgrade, updated past this point here, 2017. It's the e-commerce percent of retail sales as a function of country. And we have uh, Korea, UK, China, USA, and uh, North, uh, Japan, uh, Germany, France, and Brazil. So major uh, democracies. And well, I guess no certain China's though. Anyway, major, many major companies. And the dramatic uh, feature in this is the, is the strong showing in China. Well, I'm, I, who knows whether it's continuing up, but it's had a much better increase than the other countries, which are going up, but not so fast. Um, and that probably is part because China started off way behind in, in lots of things, and so it didn't actually have to, it didn't build the infrastructure, the shopping mall infrastructure. So having no shopping mall infrastructure, e-commerce filled in that gap and therefore shut up compared to the alternative, which was already mainly smaller stores. Uh, so that's uh, pretty interesting. If we have some US results, which are up to date, uh, 20. Uh, 19, and uh, we see that uh, e-commerce is here. We are. It's actually uh, the last year was the. I mean, uh, over the recently it's been 12.4 percent. Previously 12.1. It used to be up more like 16 uh, percent, but um, it's still really going up nice, so it's pretty solidly. It's at um, um, 140 billion. And um, here is the actual percentage um, of um, retail sales. It's about 15% at this time. Yeah. And previously it was 14%. So it's going up s slowly, but, uh, but um, steadily. Um, that's actually, when you look at the web pages and the excitement, uh, well, the excitement is on e-commerce. It is not, uh, the only issue is whether Groceries and things like that, or when shipping will be one day or two days. That's the nobody worries about the details of retail of, of in shop buying, and the, certainly the last Christmas was not so strong for in store buying. Uh, here we have um, the same plot for retail sales on the physical stores, brick and mortar, and you can see it is sort of hanging in there with. Uh, to the, in the recession in 2008, it went down, but since then it's been plugging away, going up, uh, you know, one to two percent per year. So it shows an increasing economy, but all the exciting growth is coming from the uh, e-commerce. But it is a little surprising to me e-commerce doesn't grow more, because I certainly do far more than 16 percent. Uh, 16% of my shopping online, probably 80%, who knows, something like that. Because I do the most expensive shopping, um, clothes, computers, they're all done online. Uh, the only thing in line are little hardware things to fix the tap and things in the house, buy a sprinkler, or um, of course groceries I, and, and, and food I buy. I don't buy that typically online. Although you can now get a restaurant delivery by a pretty powerful online system. So let's see what happens. This is quite interesting because people normally think of sports as a very healthy field. But it's not so healthy because here we have through February of 17. The number of households with the ESPN channel. Because remember, when you get cable, you can choose which channels. And you can see there's been a striking reduction just over these two and a half years from July 14 to February 17. And of course, this is not so live. This is live as this is broadcast live. It's not watching it for real. And that's a strong decrease. Actually, I think Disney stock. I think Disney owns ESPN uh, suffered because of this. And here's a related curve. 
Uh, maybe I used to, you know, being English, I used to follow Manchester United, which was uh, the most uh, best known uh, football, soccer club in the UK when I was a child. And you now read the, the stories of all these Premier League uh, um, clubs like Manchester City, Chelsea, Arsenal, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, and so on, signing people for 50 million pounds and things like that, huge amounts of money. And they're, of course, driven by the advertising and the television uh, viewing of the, of the uh, games. And we see that the viewership is actually declining. This is in millions of viewers. And uh, these are two channels in the, U in the UK, Sky, uh, the commercial one, and presumably this is uh, the BT, which I assume is the British BBC. And that's uh, 0.6, actually roughly the same for three years. And then this is after a peak of 1.3, is declined to 0.9. So there is some um, significant decline in the viewership of uh, sports games. And maybe that will put some cap on the salaries that these sports players get. Here's something similar for the National Football League in the US. Uh, change in ratings. And this is done for two types of households. Um, those with subscription video on demand and those without. And you can see that the NFL viewership has declined significantly, whereas the amount of use of television is um, within a couple of percent flat. Um, but from uh, over the year 2017, this is from September 8, 16 to the um, September, January 1, 17. So it was the last uh, NFL fall, 24, 2016 season. All right, now we have something different, the future. All right, well actually this future discussion, as we see, doesn't say very much. It just introduces a concept, which is of some interest, the digital transformation. And this came from a presentation that I listened to at the Consumer Electronics Show, Las Vegas, January 2017, and that was by IDC. And this big, um, one of these companies like Gartner, IDC, et cetera, which published thought pieces about the future or the past or the where things are going and does surveys and makes predictions. And it presumably is used to drive marketing strategies and things like that. All right, here we have a pretty interesting uh, graph from Mary Meeker, Kleiner Perkins. It has a little glitch in that uh, one of the technologies is unlabeled, but um, that's life. Um, if some talented person might be able to guess from what's important. Here we have the classic technology, electricity, telephone, car. And here's some less exciting technology, dishwashers, they're the slowest. Over 80 years to 25% adoption. Uh, radio and TV are between 20 and 30 years. Refrigerator was pretty fast, 20 years, as was uh, the washing machine. Uh, microwave, took, it's surprising, microwave took longer than TV to be adopted or longer than refrigerators. But here we come back to the modern technologies, PCs, mobile phones, the internet. And um, maybe, I don't know what the others are. Um, maybe Walkmans or whatever you want to call it. I mean, iPod type machines, who knows what they are, mobile media machines. Anyway, these are all measured, the most 15 for personal computers. The internet was around five, mobile phones are just a little more. So the pace of adoption is accelerating. Partly because these same technologies are also making it easier to get adopted, because they're enabling communication, fast communication across the world. In the olden days, you had to walk from village to village to, to, to sing ballads telling people what was going on. Nowadays, you just tweet it out and uh, 
and uh, everybody knows what's happening. All right, thank you very much. That's the end of uh, these ones from Mary Mika. We have some other interesting ones following. All right, DX, digital transformation. And here we have, I told you, we did the past. And there's the future going in a different direction. And a digital transformation is the application of digital technologies to everything under the sun. From cars, through homes, through transportation, through, through watching TV, through, through uh, disseminating news and so on. And so this IDC presentation focused on this concept, which is a pretty interesting concept, Consumer DX, Consumer Digital Transformation. And this is the, the sort of how they think about it. Here we, have, here, we are, here we are trying to stay alive. And we have these various things we do. We work, we have family time, we eat, and we shop more and more electronically, of course. We have some sort of sports, uh, we do some sleeping, and we do some travel, and we have some sort of entertainment. Which again can be digital, or it can be, I don't know, going to the local cockfight, or it's whatever we like to do. So each of these areas intersects with the with the technology, and there is some digital transformation. And we've already seen these key points of the consumer digital transformation. Everything is real time. It's very context aware. Google knows everything. It's always telling me about traffic near where I work, even when I'm not actually working in that place. Uh, that's, of course, only if it doesn't know my GPS uh, location. And typically it is location at work, so my laptop doesn't have GPS. And they're all personalized. And we have the cloud sitting in the back providing the reservoir of infinite computing and infinite. Uh, uh, raw data, we have the networks linking everything together. We have the things on the edge, the smartphones, the, the smart sensors, the webcams and things like that. We have data. Um, and we have the processing of everything. And then we have voice as the interface. We already discussed that in an earlier um, uh, part of the slide deck of how voice as the input is becoming more and more important because it's uh, of the fact that two things, the fact that it can be interpreted better and better. And if you could interpret it as well as you can, people type, it says uh, you can, people can speak much faster than they can type. All right, so remember the 18 to 34 we had in previous things. Well, this particular presentation said that you are still stood some chance of being affected if you're under 45. People over 45 aren't much interested, according to this, in digital transformation. And if you're under 45, it doesn't matter according to this whether you're 44 or seven. You have equal interest and presumably great interest. Um, in digital transformation, in social media, e-commerce, and so on. 